There have been many waves of immigration in the history of the United States. As soon as one had time to assimilate, it was immediately succeeded by another. And each wave, in addition to tens and in many cases hundreds of thousands of ordinary citizens ready to strive for the American dream, brought with it thousands of antisocial personalities of every type, those who wanted everything at once and by any means. The immigration of Russian speakers from the Soviet Union, which began in the late 1960s and continued until the late 1990s when the Soviet Union collapsed, was no exception. The Soviet criminals who ended up in the United States at the time were like children who were locked in a candy store and allowed to take whatever they liked. In the Soviet Union, by and large, they could either steal or extort. The other illegal ways of earning money were either poorly developed or even absent due to its differing economic model. And then they arrive in the USA and see that you can make money here on almost anything, and you can invest it somewhere and multiply it. And hungry, angry, and ambitious Soviet criminals began to engage in everything that could bring money, from extortion to multi-level fraud and submarine trading for drug cartels. In just a couple of decades, the so-called Russian Mafia managed to equal in earnings the most influential criminal gang of that time, the Italian Costa Nostra, and the American authorities ranked them, along with Latin American cartels and Italian Mafia communities, the primary criminal organizations in the world. And if you are interested to hear how gangsters from a communist country managed to reach that level of success in the capitalist world, then meet the Russian Mafia in the United States on the other side of the law. I want to ask you to take your mind off the video for a moment and look at the cool print I made for you. If you like it, you could buy any product you like by clicking the link in the description. And of course, every item you purchase contributes to the growth and advancement of the channel. Thank you for your attention. Now let's dive deeper into the story of our hero for today. First, it's important to understand the meaning of the title of today's video. The Russian Mafia is not a criminal group made up of Russians. It is not even a criminal group that came out of Russia. In the US, this is what Americans started calling all Russian-speaking gangsters in general. Regardless of nationality or the country from which they came, all of the Russian speakers were grouped together under the title of the Russian Mafia, which chose its first refuge in the US in the most Russian neighborhood of New York, Brighton Beach. Brighton originally became Russian-speaking thanks to the 40,000 Jews who settled there after leaving the Soviet Union. In the early 1970s, Jews from the Soviet Union were allowed to leave the country for their newly formed homeland called Israel. Those who wished to leave the Soviet Union were first taken by train to Vienna, and from there they were sent by airplane either to Israel or to another country where the Jewish communities would help them obtain visas. One such country was the United States. Soviet Jews usually had little money, so they chose a cheap place to live. Brighton fit this criterion perfectly. At that time, it was a poor neighborhood, populated predominantly by African American. The influx of Jews from the Soviet Union settling in Brighton en masse in the 1970s changed the neighborhood into what became known as Little Odessa. There were Russian stores and restaurants, local newspapers in Russian, and of course, Russian gangsters who ripped off their fellow Russian speakers. The first iconic face of Russian organized crime in the U.S. was Yevsi Agron. He began his criminal career in the Soviet Union. Robberies, extortion, thefts, several prison terms, by the time Agron arrived in the States, he was already a full-fledged member of the Russian underworld, which made the formation of his gang in the States much easier. When Agron arrived in Brighton Beach in the mid-1970s, there was already a small layer of wealthy Russian Jews who became Yevsi's initial victims. He gathered a gang of thugs around him and began using threats and beatings to force local merchants to pay for protection. Some of Argon's key operatives include Emil Puzirecki and brothers Boris and Veniamin Neyfeld. To give you an idea of what kind of men they were, Veniamin once lifted a guy above him with one hand and with the other plunged a knife into his heart. It is believed that he did this because the victim had insulted his girlfriend. All the witnesses then unanimously stated that the guy was going to shoot Neyfeld and he was just defending himself. So he avoided jail time. And this behavior of the people was not surprising. Argon's brigade terrified the people of Brighton. Everyone knew that these fellows could kill for a mere slanting glance in their direction, so they acted more than openly in their extortions without fear of anyone going to the police. They could break into stores or restaurants in the middle of the day and beat the owner in front of the customers for refusing to pay them. As one Brighton resident of that time recalled, as soon as Argon found out that you had something of value, you were immediately targeted. 
His brother, for example, had his restaurant bought out for a fifth of its value, and he was lucky that his children were friends with Boris Neyfeld's children, otherwise the guy might not have gotten anything at all. Or another example, Agron learned that a Russian immigrant was preparing a lavish wedding for his daughter. Yevsey thought he needed the money more and called the man, saying he was expecting a payment of $15,000, otherwise his daughter would be seriously hurt. The man was forced to pay. Agron ruled by means of terror. He intimidated much of Brighton Beach and made tens of thousands of dollars a week from it. But Yevsey had two pillars of power besides fear. His first was his ties with the American Mafia, namely with the Genovese family. The link that connected Agron to the Italians was a man named Murray Wilson, a very interesting character. The FBI called him the Meyer Lansky of his generation because of his uncanny ability in financial matters. Wilson was a partner with the Genovese family and had a close, even friendly relationship with two of its highest-ranking members, Venera Mangiano and John Barbato. Wilson was one of the activists who helped Soviet Jews move to Brooklyn, and because of this thorough involvement in Brighton, he got to know many of the Russian gangsters, including, of course, Agron, who was the main man in Little Odessa at the time. Wilson eventually brought the Russian gangsters together with the Italian gangsters, starting their cooperation, consisting of joint illegal cases of hijacking, theft, and fraud. Argon's most interesting and largest joint work with the Italians was the fraud of the Dunes Casino in Las Vegas. In this casino, the Mafia was a silent partner and had various ways to get money out of it in order to evade taxation. One such method involved the Russians. Over a period of several months, Yevsey and his men flew to Las Vegas where they received casino credit lines of $50,000 per person. However, instead of gambling, they gave the chips to a Mafia man who simply cashed them out. In this way, Agron helped remove more than $1 million from the casino. How much he himself received from this job is not known. The second pillar that helped Agron maintain his power was his acquaintance with a man named Ronald Greenwald, who was a very versatile individual. In his lifetime, he was a rabbi, a businessman, a banker, and had ties to the Genovese Mafia family. But his main virtue was his great influence on the Jewish community of New York, which he used for political purposes, becoming an indispensable person for the Republican Party of New York State. Thus, for example, he helped Richard Nixon become president by garnering support from Jewish voters and contributors. Greenwald gave Agron political cover. He was someone who could use his influence to help Agron in more delicate matters than beating money out of street vendors. However, Agron never had time to take full advantage of Greenwald's services. Although he was Brighton's most powerful racketeer, there were other gangs in the area who didn't like Agron's power, which put his life in constant danger. So in 1980, he was shot twice in the stomach on the Coney Island boardwalk, causing him to lose part of his intestines. Yevsey later dealt with the shooter, but that did not stop the assassination attempts. In January 1984, he was shot again. This time, the bullet hit him in the neck. Agron survived, but was again physically maimed. His face was partially paralyzed, which caused Yevsey to walk around with a strange, even sinister grin. The opponent in this case was Boris Goldberg, who, together with David Schuster, ran a gang that had been in conflict with Agron's gang for months. The stumbling block was the struggle for the territory where the Russian gangsters carried out their criminal activities. Yevsey, of course, guessed that Goldberg was behind the assassination attempt, but he couldn't prove it. They had even had a meeting about it, but Goldberg had managed to convince those present of his alleged innocence. Agron either did not want to take revenge or simply did not have time to do so, for in May 1985, a bullet finally did what it was intended to do. Yevsey was killed in the entrance of his house by an unknown gunman. The shooter was also unidentified. Agron was a pioneer for the Russian Mafia in the States, but he remained at the level of a not-so-big-time racketeer. Yevsey could not completely change his outlook. Mentally, he remained the same person who had extorted money from underground entrepreneurs in the Soviet Union. However, all along, there had been another rising criminal star in his gang who could not fully reveal himself while Agron was in power. But after his death, he revealed himself fully, taking the Russian Mafia to a whole other level. The police considered a man named Marat Balagula to be the most likely person to have ordered Agron's murder, and he did eventually replace Yevsey. For a long time, he had been Agron's closest advisor. Agron vaulted Marat because he was not just a tough street guy, but he had brains that allowed him to go beyond the usual extortion and into areas where there was a lot more money to be made. Balagula was also from the first wave of Soviet Jews who came to the New World for a better life. But unlike Agron, 
He had not been involved in robbery and extortion in the Soviet Union. Marat was a white-collar criminal born into a family of workers. Balagula studied well all the way to a math degree. And he also built a career, having been made manager of a food cooperative in Odessa by age 20. Here, he immediately realized how to move up the career ladder. During his first year, Marat greased local party officials, making many very good acquaintances, which eventually allowed him to get a job on the Soviet cruise liner, Ivan Frankel, serving foreign tourists. Now, Balagula could freely go abroad several times a year, which opened up new opportunities for making money. Marat carried gold and jewelry abroad, which the party bosses wanted to sell, receiving a small percentage for the sales. And he brought back all those goods that were in short supply in the Soviet Union and earned a lot of money on their sale. After working on the liner for five years, Balagula managed to buy a good apartment in Odessa as well as a summer house on the Black Sea coast. After that, he was promoted to the position of manager of the largest food cooperative in Ukraine. By the age of 30, he was among the party elite, he even knew Mikhail Gorbachev and was generally very well settled in life. But the life he saw outside the Soviet Union still seemed more attractive to Balagula. In January 1977, Balagula left the USSR and settled in New York. For the first six months, he worked as a garment cutter and learned English and then opened a restaurant called Sadko. Where he got the money for its opening is not quite clear. Perhaps something was brought with him from the Soviet Union because for the first six months he was just settling in and looking around. But that's not the point. What is important here is the fact that the restaurant was opened because it allowed Balagula to get acquainted with Agron, who was then reigning in Brighton and liked to visit Sadko. Yevsey liked the way Balagula did business and took him in. Agron's entourage was mostly people who did things first and thought later. By no means do I want to say that they were stupid or shallow, but Marat stood out from them with a different view of making money where force was not the most important tool. So it is not surprising that Balagula was the one who led Agron's gang into the famous gasoline scam. And here we must interrupt to give a little explanation. There are several different versions of this matter. Some say Agron worked in this scam with the Colombo family, represented by Michael Francese, giving the Italian 75% of the income, and Balagula entered it after Agron's death, but later left Colombo for better terms with Lucchese. Others claim that Marat did not work for Yivse at all, but ran the gasoline scam separately from him. I will not try to prove the correctness or incorrectness of these versions, as I do not know the primary sources from which they arise. Instead, I suggest you listen to the version of journalist Robert Friedman, who has spent decades studying Russian organized crime in the United States. His conclusions are based on numerous interviews with direct participants in the events, ranging from ordinary citizens who witnessed various incidents, ordinary law enforcement officers who encountered Russian gangsters, high-ranking officials from various law enforcement agencies who spent a year in catching the leaders of the Russian mafia, and with former leaders of Russian organized crime themselves. Let's start with what this gasoline scam was all about. Until the 1980s, retail fuel sales taxes were levied on gas stations. They had to pay 28 cents per gallon of gasoline sold. And in order to stay in the black, they added the tax to the price of gasoline. This is where the first variation of this scam was born, which was used by Turkish and Greek immigrants. They opened gas stations, sold the maximum amount of gasoline they could, and then when it came to pay taxes, simply disappeared most often going somewhere abroad. According to estimates of the U.S. tax authorities, on average, one such swindler could earn $500,000 to $600,000. In 1982, to close this loophole, the U.S. authorities shifted the payment of tax from gas stations to distributors who sell them gasoline. That is, the wholesaler sold gasoline to the retailer with the tax already included in the price. As it turned out, with this measure, the authorities not only did not curb fraud, but only increased its scale. Now, fraudsters bought gasoline, created dozens of fake distribution companies on paper, and sold this gasoline from one company to another, creating a daisy chain which forced the tax authorities to dig for a long time to try to find the final buyer. And then the last firm in the chain sold the fuel to gas stations with the tax already included in the price and simply disappeared, naturally not paying any taxes, but taking the money for themselves. Later, everything would be repeated again. In a week, depending on the scope of the operation, fraudsters could make from a couple hundred thousand to millions of dollars. It is believed that the scam was invented by a fraudster named David Bogatin, who carried it out in partnership with the capo of the Colombo Mafia family, Michael Francesi, and entrepreneur Lawrence Lorizo. 
However, judged by the fact that in the early 1980s, Balagula sold his restaurant and started buying up gas stations, Marat knew something too. He entered the gasoline scam at almost the same time as Bogotan. Only unlike David, he worked not with the Colombo family, but with the Genovese and Lucchese families, paying them two cents for every gallon of gasoline sold. At first, he sold gasoline mostly through his own gas stations, bought after the sale of the restaurant, but after just a couple months, Balagula became famously lucky when he got the gasoline company PowerTest as a supplier, whose annual revenue was equal to $160 million a year. Its owner, Leo Leibowitz, was starting to lose customers because gas stations buying gasoline from the Russians were charging lower prices. The Russians themselves were selling fuel below market prices because the main income came from the scam, not from the difference between the purchase and sales prices. And lowering the price accelerated the growth in the number of new gas stations willing to buy gasoline. And Leibowitz himself decided to buy fuel from the scammers, thus encountering Balagula. This allowed Leibowitz to win the competition and grow in scale. In 1985, he even bought the Getty Oil brand on the east coast of the United States. For Balagula, this allowed for continuous operation of his scam, making Marat at that time not only the richest in Agron's brigade, but probably in the whole Russian mafia that existed in America at that time. That's why Balagula is credited with Agron's murder. He had simply outgrown his boss and was ready to become one himself. By 1985, Marat already had his own ocean tankers, seven terminals for fuel storage, a fleet of gasoline tankers, truck stops with their own snack bars, and more than 100 gas stations. And most importantly, tens of millions of dollars a month. In addition, by the end of 1985, the main rival group, led by Michael Francesi and David Bogatin, had been destroyed. Their partner, Lawrence Lorizzo, became a government witness and gave up the whole scheme and its participants, who were immediately jailed. Balagula, however, became a major player in the gasoline scam, and after Agron's death, became the head of his crew. In addition to gasoline, Mara continued the racket started by his former boss. He was also constantly proving that he was now the boss of Brighton. At least 15 murders of other Russian gangsters were attributed to Balagula, including Vladimir Reznikov, who wanted to oust Marat and even organized a daring assassination attempt, shooting Balagula's office with machine guns. Marat then eliminated Reznikov through his Italian colleagues. In addition to gasoline, Marat had other illegal enterprises, but they were much smaller in scale. The only thing that could somehow compare with tax fraud was smuggling diamonds from the African country of Sierra Leone. Balagula got involved thanks to his acquaintance with Joseph Momo, whom he and his colleagues from the Genovese family made president in 1985 by paying for his election campaign. After that, Balagula laundered his money here unhindered and also organized the smuggling of diamonds from here to Thailand. There they were exchanged for heroin, which in turn was transported to Europe, where Balagula's partner, Efine Laskin, was engaged in its sale. Balagula was doing so well in the 1980s that it seemed to everyone around him as if he was some kind of criminal genius. However, of course, he was not a genius, and like all people, he made mistakes, one of which became fatal for him. It all began with the fact that Marat worked with a small gangster, Robert Fasano, who offered him the following scheme. Fasano had the data of several dozen credit cards from Merrill Lynch. He also had people who could create physical duplicates of these cards with this data. And from Balagula, he needed salesmen who were ready to make fictitious sales on a fake card and share the money stolen from them. For a couple of months, they went around to all stores controlled by Balagula and made $750,000 from this scam. Fasano, however, had been extremely careless in obtaining these cards, and soon after the scam began, he was picked up by the Secret Service. To reduce his sentence, he agreed to wear a microphone and began recording conversations with Balagula, which became the main evidence that led to Marat's conviction for credit card fraud. Balagula nevertheless managed to escape before he was locked up in a prison and spent a couple years hiding from U.S. authorities in various countries on false documents. He was caught in late 1989, and in 1990 he was sent to prison to serve an eight-year sentence for credit card fraud and an added 10-year sentence imposed in 1992 for the gasoline scam. Marat was released from prison in 2004 and lived the rest of his life in New York City. Whether he was involved in crime after leaving prison is not known. Marat Balagula passed away in 2019 from cancer. Elson and Neyfeld's War When Balagula was jailed, there were immediately two rival figures inside the Russian mafia who aimed to replace Marat as the main man in charge in Brighton Beach. 
Naturally, neither of them were going to make concessions, which eventually resulted in the bloodiest confrontation between the Russian gangs of New York, known as the War of Neyfeld and Elson. Manya Elson was born in the early 1950s in Kishinev. From early childhood, he became involved in crime, participating with older comrades in burglaries, robberies, pickpocketing, and extortion. In his 20s, he moved to Moscow, where he continued his criminal career. And then in the 1970s, together with the first wave of Jews leaving the Soviet Union, he came to the United States. Manya settled in Brighton Beach, starting to engage in credit card fraud and jewelry theft. He even managed to work briefly for Yevsey Agron. However, he soon became involved in cocaine trafficking outside the United States and ended up in an Israeli prison. He was released in 1990 and immediately returned to New York. Here, he teamed up with the Zilber brothers, more Russian gangsters. The Zilbers made most of their money from gasoline scams and also had a famous restaurant in New York called Rasputin. In the gasoline scam, the Zilbers competed with another Russian gang protected by former Agron enforcer Emil Puzirecki. Elson became the one who helped the brothers to eliminate the problem by killing Puzaretsky and taking the Silbers under his wing. Manya's reputation grew rapidly, and literally in the first year he managed to gather one of the strongest gangs in Brighton Beach. They were engaged in everything from racketeering and the gasoline scam with the Zilber brothers to trafficking and smuggling stolen jewelry abroad. The only one who could stand up to him then was Boris Neyfeld formerly an enforcer first for Agron and then for Balagula. When the latter fled the States, Neyfeld was working on a separate job, building an impressive heroin smuggling network. He bought it in Thailand, smuggled it to Singapore, put it inside televisions and sent it to Poland, from where he delivered it to the US by regular couriers. Elson and Neyfeld didn't like each other. Manya said openly that he thought Boris was nothing, which at one point got to Neyfeld, who responded with news of a $100,000 contract for Elson's murder, which eventually provoked an open conflict. Manya made the first move by attaching a bomb to Neyfeld's car. Fortunately for Boris, the fuses didn't work and the bomb didn't detonate. The answer came a couple months later when Elson was shot five times in the stomach. He survived only by a miracle. The bullets damaged his liver and spleen. They also had to remove a large portion of his intestines and one kidney. After recovering, Manya ordered the elimination of Neyfeld's chief enforcer named Alexander Slepinin. Neyfeld retaliated by ordering Elson's assassination via a black gang. Manya was accosted by a gunman in a parking lot who, after placing the barrel to his head, pulled the trigger. The gun jammed and Elson managed to fend off the killer with just a wound to his arm. Then Neyfeld hired another man from the outside to plant a bomb under Manya's car, but he was lucky again. The bomb went off in the bomber's hands. Elson responded by blowing up a Neyfeld man named Shlava Ugleba right in his hotel room, demolishing almost the entire floor of the building. And in addition to Elson and Neyfeld trying to kill each other, or people at the top of each other's gang's hierarchy, ordinary gangsters were also killed, numbering in the dozens over the few years of the war. The last event after which the war ended was the assassination attempt on Elson in July 1993 when he and his wife were shot by three of Neyfeld's men as they approached their car. Shortly after the incident, Manya made the decision to leave the US for Europe. Whether this was due to this assassination attempt or whether he was simply tired of fighting is not known. The war ended as abruptly as it began. However, the victorious Neyfeld did not become the main man in Brighton after the departure of Elson because the United States fell under the control of the legendary Russian gangster nicknamed Yapanchik. Vyacheslav Ivankov, nicknamed Yapanchik, was one of the most influential Russian gangsters of the second half of the 20th century. He began his career as a criminal in the gang of Gennady Kharkov, nicknamed Mongol, engaging in extortion and robbery. He first fell into the hands of the authorities in 1974, receiving a seven-month sentence for using forged documents. At the same time, he was inducted into the Thieves of Law Russian Secret Society, in which is similar to the Italian Mafia. After leaving prison, he returned to his old business, quite successfully conducting it until 1981, when he was caught and imprisoned for 14 years for extortion and robbery. He was freed 10 years later when, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and thanks to numerous petitions of famous and well-known personalities in Russia such as Joseph Kobzon and Alexander Romanbaum, Ivankov was released early. 
So in early 1992, he left for the United States. Brighton greeted him warmly. The local authorities knew who Ivankov was and what connections he had in Russia and Europe, and therefore treated him with respect. There was no man who was prepared to declare war on him with his own forces, and Yaponchik, who met no resistance, rose very quickly in business matters. In general, Ivankov's period in the United States coincided with the time when the Russian Mafia took the last step towards becoming what it is today. When the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia began to build a market economy and opened its borders completely, allowing dozens of different criminals from the former Soviet Union to come into contact with their counterparts abroad who had immigrated earlier, forming a worldwide criminal network. To avoid any misunderstandings, let me clarify what I mean. I am not talking about a single conglomerate with centralized control, but about a network of connections, acquaintances if you like, which serve for joint illegal operations. Ivankov was one of the first to take advantage of this new situation. Unfortunately, the information about what exactly Yaponchik was doing is not very detailed. For the most part, it is covered in dry reports of intelligence services, which indicate the activities of which he was suspected. So it is reported that in the first year of his stay in the U.S., Ivankov entered into a gasoline scam, gambling, prostitution, and arms trafficking. Next, he began venturing outside of New York City. In Miami, Ivankov got a secret stake in Porky's, a strip club, from Ludwig Feinberg, and he made an agreement with the Cali cartel to supply cocaine to Russia and help Ivankov launder Colombian money, making Yaponchik one of the largest suppliers of the drug to Russia. In Denver, he had a stake in the restaurant of Armenian thief-in-law, Vachikhan Petrosov, and in Houston, a used car dealership through which he laundered some of his money. It was also claimed that Ivankov was trying to revive the diamond smuggling from Sierra Leone in which Balagula had once participated. In general, Yamanchik made a lot of money by laundering money through this firm in Austria called Atcom Consulting. It was also rumored that his money laundering was facilitated by another Soviet emigre in Budapest named Semyon Mogilevich. However, if Ivankov met no resistance from the criminal world, the law enforcement agencies were very interested when informants began to inform them about the arrival of the Russian, who was almost immediately recognized as the main godfather of Brighton. At first, the FBI could not find Ivankov at all. They only found his home, as Yaponchik had noticed them and immediately relocated, which made the agents spend weeks trying to find him. Later, they tried to keep him under surveillance, but that still did not lead to anything. Even with permission to wiretap his phones, they were unable to gather solid evidence of his criminal activity. However, the FBI got lucky in the mid-1990s, and the necessary evidence to put Yaponchik in prison came to their hands. The essence of the case was that two people named Alexander Volkov and Vladimir Voloshin had organized an investment company in which Chara Bank invested. The money was not actually invested, but just spent on entertainment. When Rustam Sadikov, the director of Chara Bank, came to retrieve the money, he was refused. Sadikov decided that he would not give up the $3.5 million so easily and turned to Ivankov for help. Yaponchik caught the swindlers and forced them by threats to sign a contract promising to pay one of Ivankov's associates $3.5 million. And it seems that Yaponchik's men scared them well as they immediately went to the FBI. And in 1995, Ivankov was arrested, receiving 9.5 years in prison. That was the end of his American phase of life. He would later return to Russia, but that's another story. Ludwig Feinberg, or as he was also known, Lisha Tarzan, was a very extravagant gangster running his own business in Miami. He had his own strip club, famous for its explicit performances, and his most notorious crime was the sale of a submarine to the Colombian drug cartel. Feinberg was originally from Odessa. He lived in the Soviet Union until he was 13 years old and then moved to Israel with his parents in the early 1970s. He didn't like it there, so at the age of 20, he moved to Berlin. Here, he had an acquaintance selling fake medical diplomas who offered to let Tarzan try his hand at working as a dentist. Feinberg quickly realized that this was not the path for him. Then Tarzan joined a group associated with Efim Laskin, participating in robberies and extortions, but even this association did not last long, so eventually he left for the U.S. and settled in Brighton Beach. In New York, he joined the gang of Grisha Royces, nicknamed Ogre. It was said that once in a fit of rage, Royces had bitten off someone's nose, for which his gang received this nickname. 
The Royces and Feinberg families had been close friends since the Soviet Union and continued to communicate in Israel, so Royces received Tarzan with open arms. At Grisha's, he was involved in extortion as well as arson of buildings for the Gambino family. That's how the mobsters pulled insurance fraud. Tarzan was prompted to leave New York by the turbulent situation. First, his acquaintance, Vladimir Reznikov, who had declared war on Marat Balagula, was killed, and then the Elson and Nefeld War began. Feinberg decided this was not for him and went to Miami, another city with a large community of Russian immigrants. Here he met a 70-year-old man named William Seidel, owner of the largest Nissan and Suzuki dealerships in the country at the time. However, there was a dark side to Seidel. Rumor had it that he started his criminal career back with Meyer Lansky's organization and then managed his affairs so skillfully that the authorities had been investigating him for 20-plus years but had never found anything. Seidel liked the fun, cheerful, and talkative Tarzan, and they became friends so that when Feinberg needed money to open his own strip club, Seidel agreed to help. That's how the scandalous Porky Strip Club came to be. Why scandalously famous? I will not tell you because of the young people watching this video. If you're interested, you can Google it. Porky's became Tarzan's springboard into the world of serious American crime. Gangsters often went there, and Ludwig was happy to make their acquaintance, which eventually led him to cooperate with two people. The first was Juan Almeida, who sold luxury cars and yachts, and had ties to Colombian drug cartels, who often used his dealership. The second was named Nelson Yester, and he was a drug trafficker working for Pablo Escobar. This is how Tarzan got into the cocaine business, by organizing shipments of white powder through these men to Russia, and then the delivery of military equipment in the opposite direction. So in 1993, six months before Escobar's death, Tarzan managed to sell him six Russian Mi-8 military helicopters for $1 million each. And in 1997, he oversaw a deal to sell a $100 million submarine to the Cali cartel, which failed only because Feinberg was arrested. It turned out that Grisha Roises, who had moved in with him in Miami, was an informant and had turned Feinberg in. Tarzan himself also agreed to cooperate. However, it is not known what exactly he gave to the authorities in addition to the surrender of Almeida and Nelson Yester, but the sentence was reduced from life to 33 months. In October 1999, he was deported to Israel, and in 2012, he went to prison again in Panama for pimping, from where for some time he conducted his video blog on YouTube. If anyone is interested, search for Mr. Tarzan and you will find his channel. Semyon Mogilevich didn't quite fit the theme of our video because he wasn't based in the United States, but I couldn't not tell you about him because his name always comes up when it comes to the Russian Mafia. Mogilevich was of the same generation of Soviet mobsters, such as Ivankov. He also began in the late stage of development of the Russian Mafia when it was no longer extorting money from businessmen racketeers and international criminal corporations whose money and interests were scattered in many countries around the world. Mogilevich was born in Kiev in 1946 and later moved to Moscow. He began his criminal career with petty theft and currency trading on the black market. For the latter, he was convicted twice, serving a total of about six years. During the time that Mogilevich lived in Moscow, he managed to make acquaintances and develop joint affairs with several local criminal groups, among which were Lyubertsky, Soltevsky, and Orakovsky. In the early 1990s, Mogilevich decided to leave Russia. He received citizenship in Israel and moved to Hungary to live. From this period, we can begin to see the development of Mogilevich's organization, which would become known as the main organization among the Russian mafia in the 21st century. From the money he earned in Russia, Simeon bought several nightclubs in Prague, Kiev, Budapest, and Riga, which he used as the centers of his enterprises in the field of prostitution. However, Mogilevich made most of his money from cocaine and heroin, which he imported and sold in Eastern Europe. On this basis, by the way, he started a business relationship with the Italian Camorra, which was then operating in the Czech Republic. Simeon helped them launder money through the then poorly controlled Russian banking system. Mokalevich's drug operations eventually grew so large that he bought an entire airline that had gone bankrupt in Georgia shortly after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and he delivered heroin from the Golden Triangle on his own airplanes. Having earned his primary capital from the drug trade, Mogilevich began to reinvest the proceeds. Thus, he invested in jewelry factories in Moscow and Budapest, through which he and the Solonsevskaya group resold stolen jewelry. They also used these factories to run scams. 
For example, they took a Fabergé egg from someone for restoration, made a good fake which was returned to the owner, and the original was sold on the black market. Mogilevich also had two vodka factories, also in Moscow and Budapest, through which he smuggled alcohol. According to the Hungarian authorities' calculations, he managed to export about 3 million liters of vodka from Hungary per year without paying any duties or taxes. But Mogilevich's most serious legal investments were in the arms industry. He bought several companies involved in one way or another in Hungary's military-industrial complex. In particular, he had such firms as Army Cooperative, a factory producing mortars and anti-aircraft guns, and Dijep Hungary General Machine Works, a manufacturer of artillery guns, mortars, and firefighting equipment. And in 1994, Mogilevich acquired a license allowing him to buy and sell means of warfare, which fully legalized him as an arms dealer. However, most of his money was still black. He laundered it through Russian banks, of course, but in order to fully make use of the vast sums he had at his disposal, it were better for the funds to pass through some Western financial institutions. At first, Mogilevich did it through Great Britain, but the local authorities quickly realized who they were dealing with and closed this opportunity and banned him from entering the country. And then he pulled off a daring venture, organizing a large company in Canada, which was capitalized at $1 billion. It was called YBM, and on paper, it was a scientific company with its own research facilities, for the use of which third-party firms paid money. As an example, they claimed to have invested a way to desulfurize oil. In fact, it was a huge fake, created purely for money laundering. Nevertheless, this scam managed to last three years, during which several billion dollars were laundered. And Mogilevich laundered even more through the Bank of New York. With the help of many shell companies, he introduced black money into the bank and withdrew the white money. In total, he managed to launder about $7 billion through the bank, which at the time was the largest money laundering in the history of the United States. America is still after Mogilevich, who will be 67 years old when this video is released. They accuse him of fraud and money laundering. Where he is is not known exactly, but the media continues to call him the most powerful boss of the Russian Mafia. That was the story of the Russian Mafia, a criminal organization that in a couple decades was able to go from small-time extortionists to what resembles a multinational corporation.